Well, good morning, Renewal Church, and happy Sunday to you today. Thank you guys for coming today. Amen? Amen, amen. amen. Thank you guys for, for watching us online. Thank you for um, being there. I uh, hope you enjoy the service today, and God speaks to you in a mighty way today. Well, today is the last Sunday in the upper room. It's the last Sunday of 2020, and um, we are very thankful for, for God and what he has done for us in this place we are thankful for, for God just um, being good to us. Amen? Let's give him applause for being so good to us. Thank Jesus for being our supplier. Thank him for being our provider. Thank him for being our joy in all this season of stuff going on that he's been faithful to us. Amen? Can you guys stand and we'll pray and we'll get ready to worship him and give him the glory that he so deserves. And thank him for this place. Father God. We thank you so dearly, God, for this place that you have provided for us. Thank you, God, for uh, meeting us here, God, this whole three years that we've had this place, God. Thank you for changing lives. Thank you for loving us, providing for us, God. Thank you for your touch that we feel when we come here, God. And today, God, we ask for you to feel that touch from you again, Jesus. Show us, show us who you are today, Jesus. Show us what you do in our lives and what you can do, God. And moving forward, keep keep being with us, God, and just having your presence all over this church, Jesus. We ask of that today. And today, God, we ask for your word to just cut us right to the innermost being of our soul, God, and change us. The way that we think and the way that we know you, God. So we know you better when we walk out of this place today. In Jesus' name, amen.
I search the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough then you came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you there's nothing nothing is better than you this i know it's true
keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, and that is who you are, 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 even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you work it Even when I don't feel it, you work it You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you are Way late, miracle work Promise keep light in the darkness My God, that is who you are
and we thank you in advance for what's to come because we trust in you that you're making a way. God, you alone are worthy to be praised. You are our strong tower and we worship your holy name. Be with us this morning as we receive your word, God. Keep us and guide us, Lord. And we trust in you that as long as you're in our lives, we always have you by our side. Thank you, Jesus. And in your mighty and powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. God is good. All right, so <clears throat> I just I just whispered to Don uh, as I was coming up here that I'm going to actually preach a whole different message than I preached the first message. Uh, so we're just going to see how this goes out, right? All right, so let me ask you this question, okay? So here we are, three years later, we're in this last meeting of this facility, Right? We will, we will forever be known as the church that used to meet above Rita's, right? How cool is that, right? Three years ago, we didn't have, um, I was going to say a pot, but I knew that probably, that probably wouldn't be a good thing in church, so, uh, uh, so we, we didn't have anything. We were, we had no, no money in the bank, right? We had no job descriptions, we had no name, we were just a group of people that just started to meet three years ago, and God began to just lead us and guide us, right? Um, and, and, and I have to say this, that as much, as much as I love all that, the cool thing about all of this is that our family has gotten bigger as we've been, been meeting here, amen? amen? So I used to tease with my sister, whenever I want my, my sister to, she, I'm 11 years older than her. And my brother's 13 years older than her, so whenever we want her to be quiet, because she's the baby, she always, always, always has to talk. Um, we always remind her that our life used to be simpler without her, because we could all, our family could fit into a booth. Right? There's, there's four of us, so we could always, you know, there's always a booth for us to sit into for dinner, and then she came along, we had to add a high chair, and, uh, you know, and, but, but we, we, we do that in jest with her, but the reality of it is, she's made our, our lives happier and complete uh, when you add to your family. Of course, now, it's funny, we were, we were at my mom's house uh, for Christmas, and her house is the same size, but yet this family is, like, getting bigger. So these children are having children, and they're bringing these, these, these I think they're called boyfriends and girlfriends over. <laughs> and I'm like, when do they get to show up and have my food? And, and my mom buys them gifts. I'm like, why? They're... Listen, if there's no ring, there's no gift. <laughs> right? Because I, I got I to gotta be honest. I got to be honest. I don't know if you'll be here next year. <laughs> you know, it's, it's crazy how that works, right? But, but, but obviously, when you have a full house, it's so much fun. It's amazing. So here's what I want to tell you. This is the booth. We're about to take the booth away and add a farm table. Amen? <laughs> And our job is to bring as many people to the table as possible. Amen? Amen? And everybody's welcome to the table. And we want to give them what the Lord has given us. Amen. And so we're excited about this transition. This chapter is closing, meaning that God's built, writing a new chapter for us. So it doesn't matter where you come along on this journey. We're happy you're here. Hold on. Grab tight. Uh, God's taken us to some really cool places. And we want to do this together as a family. As, and uh, so we're excited about it. So... We're thankful with what the Lord has given us, and we are, we are moving forward. Now, with that said, I want to jump into our text, Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse number 10. We've been talking about spiritual warfare, and the very first message I ever <laughs> preached to our church, because at that time, three years ago, we were, very, we were hurting. A lot of us were, uh, just went through a huge split at the church that we were at. A lot of us were in pain. A lot of us were upset. A lot of us were angry. A lot, a lot of things were going on. And I asked the Lord, that was the first time in my life where I actually got up that morning and asked the Lord, what do you want me to tell your people? 
And the, believe it or not, Ephesians 6 is the first text that I read to you back three years ago, which is kind of crazy. And to remind us that our battle is not with people. Our battle is with the enemy, Satan. And, and it's him that we are fighting against, not other people. And so, um, and so it would kind of come full circle, have we not? You know, with all this? Excuse me. Uh, Ephesians 6, verse number 10 says this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might, and put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against authorities and against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual for the forces of evil in heavenly places, so it says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having to done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as the shoes for your feet, having them at the, uh, put on the readiness of given by the gospel of peace. Verse 16, in all circumstances, take up the shield of, take up the shield of faith to which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the, hel the helmet of salvation, and, and here it says this, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, if I were to ask you, do you know what a secret weapon is? Isn't it great to be in a football game and to have a secret weapon? <laughs> right? Yeah. To know that no matter what takes place, you got somebody on your team that you have labeled them the secret weapon. Well, let me tell you what my secret weapon was growing up. When we grew up, we uh, were kicked out of our houses all day long because our parents didn't want us in the house. And, and, and they would work. So it's not like they're like, no, I don't want you in my house at all. Well, I'm, well where am I going to go? Go play football. Go run a ditch. Go, go build a fort. Right? Go catch a lizard. Go do something. But you can't be in the house. See, this is when parents really love their kids, right? So, <clears throat> so we had a huge field. And so, so what would happen every summer is we would all get together and we would play football in the summer, right, in Florida, and we would play in this field. It was called, we, it was very, it was called the field. <laughs> Everybody knew where we were going. Where are you going? We're going to the field. What are we going to do? We're going to play football. Everybody, you just know that. So we have, we, we play football, and then all the neighborhood would get together, and then we would divide up teams, and usually a lot of times, because we were a lot, a lot of us were brothers, we would be on the same team as our brother. Well, my secret weapon as I was playing football was my brother. He was the bull. We actually had a name. Like, our secret weapon is like, like we'd huddle up and be like, all right, bull, you're going to get the football, and you're just going to run. And my brother knew that we would hand him the football, and his job was just to run straight, and it would take the entire team to drag him down. <laughs> Right? He wasn't the fastest kid, but he was the strongest kid. And whenever we needed short yardage for that first down, or, or we, all had, we had to cross that line to get that touchdown, right? We would give the ball to the bull. <laughs> you with me? And that was our secret weapon. And maybe in life sometimes you think, you know, I got to have a secret weapon. Can I just tell you, in the Christian life, you do have a secret <laughs> weapon, and that secret weapon is the Word of God. Listen to me. It is so unbelievably powerful. It is so unbelievably amazing yes. that when God's word goes out before us, that, that things begin to change. Things begin to, to really shape, shape up. Let me just give, give you a, a, a text. Um, it's not in your notes because I just put this in here. You ready? So I want you to go to your Bible, and I want you to find Bible Mark. 2 Kings chapter 22. 2 Kings chapter 22. It's not in your notes. This is a brand new message just written five minutes ago. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't written five minutes ago. It was just added. But I want to read something to you. Because so many times in the history of Israel, they would lose the word. Now think about this. You're God's people. And you could go to church. And if you went to the temple or the church or whatever, you went to the house of God... There could be a chance that nobody ever reads the word. Think about it. And what would happen to God's people is, if God's word wasn't proclaimed and read, then God's people would go start and go, you know what? Maybe my God isn't the secret weapon. Maybe I could go and, and let's go look at other secret weapons and let's go out and see what they're doing and let's go find our worship somewhere else. Well, 
In the history of Israel, they have all these kings that came at, after David and Solomon. And some kings were really good kings, and some kings were really bad kings. And sometimes the good kings were good kings because of their call back Israel to worship God again. So let me tell you about this one good king. You ready? 2 Kings chapter 22. Here's what the Bible says in verse number 1. Josiah was 8 years old. Now stop for a minute. 8 years old when he became king. Now check it out. 8 year old Jason, king? Let me tell you what we're doing. Let me tell you what we're talking. No more school. Amen? No more homework. The basic food groups are now what L's eat, right? Candy, candy canes, candy corn, and syrup. Those are your four food groups, right? I mean, if you're a king at eight years old, can you just imagine, the, you know, what? I mean, eight years old and you're king. Keep reading. It says this. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidiah, the daughter of Adoniah, of, of Bozkath. And he, in verse 2 says this, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in all the way of David, his father, and he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. From the very moment in his life when he began to be king, for, so, at eight years old, he said, we're going to go back to God. Amen. If an eight-year-old can turn a nation back to God. What is your excuse? You with me? If an eight-year-old can get it, why can't a 38-year-old? Why can't a 48-year-old? Why can't an 18-year-old? You with me? Keep reading. He says this. Verse 3 says, In the 18th year of King Josiah, the king sent Shaphan, the son of Asmaliah, the son of Meshulam, the secretary, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go to Helkiah, the high priest, that he may count the money that has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the threshold have collected from the people. He goes, Okay, listen. Now I've been reigning for a little bit. Now I've got my feet under, under me. Now let's go back to the church. And let's figure out how much money we have. And let's go back and let's rebuild God's house. See, at some point in your life, you have to know that, that you got to get back to God. There's got to be some kind of reason to go in, back to his house. And so the king says, all these people have spread out and they worship all these other gods. I'm going to call everybody back to him. And how do we do this? We rebuild the temple. Let's go back and fix it up. Let's go back and make sure that God's house has a priority. Right? And so they go and they do this. And so they count all the money. They get all the skills people together. And they begin to go and they rehab the house of God. Great story. So they go in and they're rehabbing and they're pulling stuff down and they're ripping baseboards out and they're putting in some nice plan, uh, plank for the, for, the, for, the, for the ceiling and for the, for the roof and they're putting in a fireplace. <laughs> Somebody say, let's add a spiral staircase right here, right? And they're, they're, they're doing all this stuff and, and it says that, and, and we're not going to read it, but it says it that they went into the cornerstone of the church and they found the Bible. They found the law of God. The first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They were like, oh my gosh, we have got to go tell the king this. They take the, the law. They carry it back to where Josiah is in his temple. They say, king, we found God's word. We found the law. They open it up and they start reading it to him. Now listen to me. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Listen. He had never heard it. And the Bible says that when he heard the words of the Lord, he tore his clothes. And he said, how in the world have we missed this? And do you know what he does? He calls the entire nation together. And he makes the high priest stand up. And the high priest reads the entire first five books of the Bible to the entire nation of Israel. And he calls the people back 
to worshiping the Lord. That's the secret weapon. See, when you realize that the word is everything and you realize that's what changes the hearts of you and the, and the hearts of people around you, listen to me, that's, what, that's your secret weapon. That's so good. Let me give you a hint. If you got a grandchild or you got a grandbaby or you even got a kid and they just are having issues in life, when they go to sleep, here's what you should do. Go sneak into their room, open your Bible, and start reading to them in their sleep. Amen. Read the word over them. Yeah. Like, Jason, it's cr- why would you do that? Because you've got to start putting some good stuff into them. Yeah. If they're struggling, they need that. Yeah. If you got somebody in your, in your life that's struggling with maybe depression, and they're just battling some dark days, man, get the word read to them somehow. Yeah. Start putting the word of God in your house Start putting the Word of God in your marriage. If you're having marriage problems, listen to me. You can go to all the counseling, and you'll spend a lot of money. But let me just help you out by starting somewhere. Just read the Word with each other. Because when your spouse loves God more than they love you, trust me, your marriage will grow. It will grow, and it will get better. You have, to, you have to just say, okay, Jason, either what you're saying is absolutely true or what you're saying is absolutely false. And let me just kind of read this to you. Verse 23, or chapter 23 of 2 Kings, verse 1, it says, The king sent all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem were gathered to him. And the king went up to the house of the Lord and with him and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and all the prophets and all the people, both small and great, and he read in their in their uh, and he read in their hearing all of the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by the pillar, and he made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all of his heart and all of his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people joined him in this covenant. See, it took somebody who was strong enough to be a leader and says, this is, what our, this is what we're missing. You know, we can rebuild the house all we want, but if we don't bring the word into it, there's no power. Like, we could have a really beautiful church on Appy, but if we never, think about it, if we never show up and read the words of the Lord, there is no power in that house. At some point, you have to say, is the word the truth, or is it just what we do? Is it, is it really the power, the, 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 the secret weapon, as it says, the, and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God? In other words, when he, when he talks about the sword of the Spirit, he's not talking about like a broad sword, where you, like, you're swinging and, and flailing it around. It's more like a dagger, and that's why sometimes when you go to church, and the preacher preaches a message, you're like, oh, I thought he loved me. <laughs> right? And sometimes the word hits you. Sometimes it's like, it's, but it, that's what it does. That's right. So my question to us is, okay, so as we move, move in this next chapter, is the word still going to be something that we declare to each other? Yes. You know, one of the saddest commentaries of the last three years that started this whole process, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to say a couple things. And then I'm just going to tell you this. After today, we're closing that chapter on everything. But when we started, we were so broken. We had leaders, listen to me, that got up in that church, and they never used the word of God. Like nobody ever got up and said, we were reading the Bible, and this is what the Bible told us. You know what they said? This is what our attorney said. And we were like, we don't care about your attorney. It's not our attorney, because our church doesn't have an attorney. It's your attorney. And what do we care about him? We want to hear what the Lord says. Listen to me. That's all that matters in this place. What does God say? What does he say? What does he want from us? What does he want us to react? What does he want us to do? And remember, for the first three months of those through the, that three years, I said, we're not going to make a single decision. We're just going to we're going to come in here. We're going to hear the word. We're going to worship, and we're going to pray. Amen. No decisions were made. We just are going to hear from the Lord. 
and then God begin to move. See, when you allow yourself to be still and allow his word to be poured into you, that's when he moves. Amen. Haven't you noticed that there's people that, that sometimes, have you, have you ever been in a conversation where you know you're about to bring up a, a, a certain subject, but the person that doesn't want to talk about that subject, they're just, they're all over the place. They're always trying to redirect, you know, everything. But if we would just stop and calm down and let's talk about this issue so we can move on. It's always better to deal with the problem and then move on yes. rather than to avoid it. Yeah. God wants us sometimes to sit still and to allow him to pour his words into us. Because right. sometimes the, his words need to move us to action the way it, it moved King Josiah. Yes, you can be eight years old. And yes, you can decide to follow the Lord. But until you have the word backing you up, you don't have the power. Amen. His intentions were great. Everything was awesome. He did everything he was supposed to do. But it didn't fundamentally change the nation until the word, God's word, was found. Amen. Make sense? Yeah. When you want God to change your situation, my question to you is, tell me what are you reading? Mm -hmm. What is the God speaking to you? What, what words is, or what stories is, is he showing you that is changing your life? Right. Because if the, if the word of God is the spirit... Uh, the, the, the sword of the spirit and it changes us then you got to use it yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. you got to pull the secret weapon out yeah. so let me teach you something you ready y'all yeah. want it yeah. I'm going to give it to you yeah. listen yeah. to me and, I, and I'm going to give you this, this, this ammo you can use it in the new church yeah. alright you ready yeah. Yeah. book chapter verse yeah. say it yeah. book yeah. chapter yeah. verse when people come in, they start griping and complaining, and you're going to look at them and say, book, chapter, verse. Meaning, I don't care about your pity party. Tell me what the word is saying to you. Book, chapter, verse. Right? Because when you say that, that means God has authority. His word has the authority. So when you have issues with your kids, you look at them and go, book, chapter, verse. And they'll go, what? You go, oh, you, oh, you don't get this one. Right? Because it, 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 all that matters. <laughs> but don't be like my grandma. So my, when my grandmother was teaching me the Bible, uh, in her, she didn't get saved until she was like in her 50s. She was raised Catholic her whole life. And then, and then uh, in her 50s uh, came to Christ. And she, and she would teach us about the, the Ten Commandments. And she would always go to the, like, honor your father and your mother. Now, remember, I wasn't raised by a father. So she goes, remember, honor your father and your mother, but especially your mother. I'm like, and then I didn't learn that till like I was like ten years old. That, that especially your mother, she added that. <laughs> but she always, and especially your mother, you know, you can't add to that kind of stuff. You got to just say this is what it is. Mm -hmm. And so when you when you have issues in your life, you say book, chapter, verse, because show me what God says in this, and then I can make a determination. Mm -hmm. Listen to me, church. Let God be the authority in your life. Don't listen to me. I am not your authority. I am not your authority. The word of God has to be your authority. Amen. I'm the guy that's encouraging you to go to the book and, and say, what does God want you to do? Because yeah. people will say this to me. Well, pastor, sh should, I, should I take this job or should I not take this job? Here's my, here's my answer. What does God tell you? Yeah. What's God saying to you? Yeah. Well, I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. <laughs> well, if you don't know yet, don't make a decision. Yeah. Ask the Lord to show you. Yeah. Right? He's big enough to show it to you. Amen. Well, sometimes he can actually put things on a billboard for you at times if you need it. He can do anything. He can bring somebody along that can give you a verse. Yes. So let God speak. Let him have that authority. And when Josiah, when the, when the book was read to the people, man, the people heard. I mean, can you imagine? They haven't heard the words of the Lord in years. And he was so upset because he's like, who kept this from us? You mean to tell me that, that the goodness of the Lord and the, and the story of Joshua? Man, how come we haven't heard all these things, man? Who's been keeping this from us? What do you mean the law? I mean, I didn't know. Uh, honor your father and your mother. Are you serious? And don't, don't covet and don't steal. Who, who, why, have we, why is this the first that I'm hearing this? It's 
always going to be your secret weapon. Listen to this. Let me give you some thoughts real quick about all of this stuff. Because, because sometimes when God gives you the word, there's an expectation that goes along with it, right? Yeah. Right? If, you, if, God gives you, if God gives you his word, then there's got to be an expectation that comes along with that. In other words, if, if somebody gives you like a car, there's got to be an expectation that goes along with that, right? Like, for instance, you've got to know how to drive, right? Amen? Like, we, 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 have, we have purchased vehicles for our children with the expectation and the understanding that they know how to drive, that they know where the gas tank is, that they understand changing the oil and rotating your tires and, and clean, keeping your car clean, Right? These are the expectations that you have to come along. Oh, I, I, I got I to clean it too? Well, who's going to go out in your car and get all your little McDonald's bags out of there? I don't know. I just, I don't know. I, I just thought y'all would do it. No, give me the keys back. Right? So, there, so if you mistreat or mistrust that, 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 that presence, then, then you can have to be taken away. So here's what the Lord has about us. God has expectations of people who preach and teach his truth. Okay? Jeremiah chapter 23. Here's, here, here's the first point, and then I'm going to read the text to you. God expects his prophets to preach both blessings and judgments. Meaning this, that there's an expectation that God puts upon me as I proclaim his word, that I just don't give you just the good stuff. You got to get the bad stuff too. Right? I mean, it's not just always good news. It's not always just chicken soup for the soul. Every Monday is just a great day. No, Mondays are horrible. <laughs> right? Yeah. Mondays are just a drag. All right? So here's what he says. This is in Jeremiah chapter 23, at verse number 16. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. And let me stop for a second and tell you what a prophet was. So there's three offices in the Old Testament, prophet, priest, and king. You could not be a king and hold the office of prophet and priest. They were all completely separate. You could not have your, your hand in, 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 in different places. If you were the king, then you needed to be the king. If you were a priest, you needed to be the priest. If you were a prophet, you needed to be a prophet. Jesus is the only one who is all prophet, priest, and king. Amen. He holds the offices of all three. But man does not. So when you are the office of a prophet, your job, you are called what's called a seer. You see this in the, in the uh, Old Testament text, S-E-E-R. You would see the words of the Lord, and you would proclaim what you saw. That's why they were called seers. They would see the words, and they would stand up for God's people, and they would say, thus says the Lord. Boom. Or they would have a dream, and they would get an interpretation of that dream, and they would say, this is what the Lord has said. This is what the Lord has shown. Okay? So a prophet's job was to go before God's people and say, this is what God wants you to know. Yeah. All right? So he says this. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the words of the Lord, it shall be well with you. And to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say, no disaster shall come upon you. Jeremiah is, prophing, is prophesying to the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel is leaving God and they are, they are worshiping false gods. God's prophets, he was telling his prophets to tell them to stop or judgment's going to come. The prophets did not give the word to the people. The people kept leaving the Lord and going after false gods. Jeremiah was the only prophet that stood up in front of those people and says, if you don't stop, Babylonian captivity is going to come for 70 years and you're going to lose everything. Jeremiah would get up and he would preach and prophesy in front of the king. You know what the king did to Jeremiah? Took him and threw him in prison. You know why? I don't want to hear this negativity out of your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Think about it. 
And then, and then basically there was even time where God told Jeremiah, the people refused to hear me. They need to understand that judgment is coming. They're going to lose everything. They're going to be, it's going to be a complete wasteland. I want you to strip down and basically we're almost next to nothing and walk around and, and do this and preach. What? I got to just wear, what? what? Speedos? And so he did it. And people are like, you are out of your mind, Jeremiah. And Jeremiah says, this is what God told me to do. And when it was all said and done, guess, who, guess which prophet was correct? It was Jeremiah. And judgment came, and the Babylonians came, and that began their 70 years of captivity because they refused to listen to the truth. Think about this. How many churches go unprepared in this world because their pastors won't preach truth? Look, and listen, it, man, I just, I just want everyone to love me. I want, believe me, I want everyone to love me too. Because I am a lover, not a fighter. Right? Right? Thank you, Judy. <laughs> I don't want to be in a fight with anybody. But at some point in life, you got to say, this is what God says. And if you choose not to follow what the Lord says, then, then basically destruction comes after that. For instance, I mean, you know, when, you, when you're talking to a married couple, you're like, listen, just be faithful and be true in your marriage and, and just fight for it and fight for it and fight for it. But yet, when you have people say, you know what, my marriage is, ah, it's not what it is. I'll just do whatever I want. The Bible says that when you commit adultery, it's like going and burning your house down. That's the destruction that causes. We have to understand that when we sin, that there is problems that come along with those things. That when we don't follow God's path, that there, there are things that will come. Listen, and we're not yelling at people. We're just saying, be cautious. There are blessings when you fight to stay pure in your life that God gives you. And God says, my hand will be upon you. I will bless you because you are fighting in this evil and wicked world to be pure. I bet you guys just looking down on churches going, I just is there a pure church anywhere? Will, will there be one church that will keep itself pure from the world? For me? For me? Is there one church that is going to be ready when I come again? Is there just one church? Any church? I would love for the Lord us. We're us, Lord. And God says, listen, I expect my prophets to preach blessings and cursings. How about this one? Same, same chapter, same Jeremiah. God expects his prophets to know the difference between his word and your opinion. Verse 26 says, how long shall there be, shall there be lies in the hearts of the prophets who prophesy lies and who prophesy the deceit of their own heart? who think to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they will tell one another, even as their fathers forgot my name for Baal. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let him who has my word speak, my, speak the word faithfully. He says this, What has straw in common with wheat, declares the Lord. Don't come here listening for my opinion. Come here to hear the words of the Lord. Amen. Because my opinion is no greater than straw. It won't help you for anything. Mm -hmm. But the wheat is what gives you nutrition, right? right? The wheat is what we can make sandwiches out of. Amen? Amen. <laughs> right? Yes. Pizza. <laughs> yes. Bread and butter. <laughs> That's the stuff, man. That's the stuff that God gives us that, that, that will, even though sometimes it's bad for us, it makes us better. It'll nourish our soul. Sometimes hearing bad stuff is a good thing because it motivates us to change. Yeah. That's powerful. How about this one? God gives the expectation to his prophets, his preachers and teachers, to give the truth, not somebody else's truth. Jeremiah 23. Look what it says here in verse 29 and 30. Is not my word like fire, 
declares the Lord? Do you realize there's churches when they pastors get up and preach, there's no, there's no fire. There's no motivation. They're like, hey, welcome to church. Uh, I guess today we're just going to go run through a couple things and we'll give you some verses and then we'll go home. Look, man, my life could be falling apart. I need something. Right? I need something. I need, I, I need something to get me through something. Is not my word like fire declares the Lord and like a hammer that breaks the rock into pieces? He says, therefore, behold, I am against, I am against, I am against. Did you catch this? The prophets declares the Lord who steal my words from another. You know what that means? That means God expects me to stand before you and give you a message that is for you for this church. If he wanted me to preach a Joel Osteen message, he would have named me Joel Osteen. With me? If he wanted me to preach a Billy Graham crusade, he would have named me Billy Graham. Right? If he wanted me to do be chicken soup for the soul, he would say, you are pastor chicken soup for the soul. He says, no, you are Jason Henderson. You are at Renewal Church. You are to give them my words. You are to give them my message. And then you're to shut up and sit down. Right? Don't, don't, you know, don't, don't, it's not about you. You declare my words that I give you. So that means Jason Henderson has to shut the world out and listen to the voice of God every week because every week he stands before you to tell you what the Lord wants you to know. And the only way for me to do that is to spend time with him that week and allow him to pour truth into me. If I don't do that, then I have robbed you of your message before the Lord, and I will stand before the Lord, and he will say, Jason, on the 27th, remember the message I told you to preach, and you didn't do it? No, Lord, don't remember that one at all. Well, I didn't give you that message. You know, you should have spent more time with me. Yeah, but I got so busy. I would have loved to hang out with you that week, Jesus, but, man, I just there were so many great bowl games on. And I mean, you know how much I love football. He'll say, I don't care. It's not your job. Your job is to give my people my word. I take that so serious. And I, that carries a, a heavy weight around my neck, knowing that, that I have to give you something from the Lord. And I, sometimes I don't even know what it is. Like sometimes I preach and people will say, oh my gosh, Jason, when you said that, that's exactly what I needed. I am not that smart. <laughs> Just go tell you. People go, do you have a, you got a microphone in my house that you're listening? Man, listen, that's creepy. I can be arrested for that kind of stuff. You know, and I ain't going down for that. But isn't that the, the powerful thing of the word, though, right? Yes. He just, he, he, you listen, and he, you say, God, give me the truth, and you get the truth, and you pour it out. Yes. And you just let God just deal with how he deals with you. Yes. And he moves. Now, let me ask you this question. What are you doing with your secret weapon? What are you doing with your secret weapon? For some of you, you might have to go back into the temple, which is you. And you might have to do some cleaning to pull the word back out. Because maybe it's there and you just haven't used it in a while. And maybe you just need to spend some time with the Lord. See, I don't want us to go into this new place just cool. I want us to go in there motivated to know that God has a word for us. Because you know what? I hate to break it to you. I'm not the only preacher in that building. You guys are preachers too. There's people that need to hear from you. There's words that God's going to pour into you that you need to share with somebody. I don't know, Jason, that's just, really? How about, how about in your home? How about, how about something like that? How about, i, I got to start pouring the truth of the word into my kids. i got to start pouring the truth of the word into my relationships. And i gotta start, I got to start bringing the word into what I do in my life because that's the secret weapon. That's what helps you not kill people. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. That, 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 the word is what changed you from going cursings to, bless your heart. 
Now, some of y'all are, are new to being in the South. Let me give you some etiquette <laughs> about being here, okay? Just so you know, if you're not from here, let me help you. You can say whatever you want about somebody as long as you end it with bless their heart. <laughs> Makes it all better. Think about it. That person is such an idiot. Bless their heart. <laughs> See, it it, it, it it helps you out, you know. I cannot believe that person got their driver's license on I-4. Bless their heart. <laughs> See, so you can say whatever you want about them as long as you add, add that at the end. But the bless your heart comes from the word, meaning that you got to get the grace, yeah. right? Yeah. You got to give people grace, yeah. and you got to give yourself grace. You got to give yourself grace. You got to let yourself grow. You got to just say, okay, God, baby steps, baby steps, and grow me. So maybe today you're here, and you're like, Jason, I can't, I don't even know where to be. If I, if I were to start this year reading my Bible, where do you start? Check it out. We have these little things called phones, and there's an app called the Bible app. And if you sign up for the Bible app, they'll send you verses every day. It'll give you your verse for the day. It'll tell you what verses you should read today, and it'll just give it to you. And that might be the verse that you need for that day, for that moment, for that time. I just say do it. Have that as a part of your life. Make that a part. It's free. Add the Bible app to your phone and just make it a part of it. Some of them have reading plans on them. And they'll even tell you what to read. There's even one that will read to you. I mean, how, how lazy have we? I mean, we made it so easy today, right? But I'm going to tell you, my favorite thing to do is sometimes, usually it's Monday or Tuesday, and that's when I begin to study for Sunday. I'll just open the Word, and I'll just start reading, and God will start just speaking to me. You're like, man, Jason, I'm just struggling I got a lot of decisions to make this year. Proverbs. There are 31 Proverbs in the book of Proverbs. You could read a proverb a day and have it done in a month. Think about that. That's pretty amazing. Somebody says if you read more Proverbs, you'll read less Psalms. <laughs> right? If you have all the wisdom, you won't need to go through and, and, and lament and, and cry over stuff, right? You know? Or maybe, or maybe you're like, man, start with the Gospels. Let me just give you a little hint. If you've never read the Bible before, don't go Genesis, then go to Exodus, then Leviticus, and then Numbers. By the time you get to Numbers, you're going to quit. I'm just going to tell you the truth. Start, start, go with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Start in the New Testament. There's nowhere in the Bible where it says, hey, you have to start here. Start somewhere. But let me tell you something. It's all good. Listen to me. It's all good. Like, every bit of it is amazing. So some people say, well, Numbers, you know, there's a lot of Numbers. Listen, there's a story of a dude talking to a donkey in the, in the, in the book of Numbers. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There's a talking donkey. <laughs> That's amazing. Start somewhere. Here's where I don't want you to start, okay? Do not start in the book of Revelation. <laughs> all right? It, uh, listen, I don't understand it all. And if anybody says they understand it, run. Right? So, but just start and ask God, show me some, some, some of you today. Just show me some of you today. And then just read it. And you might say, well, Pastor, I read it. I don't really understand it. That's okay. Do you know how many times that happens to me? And I've got to go back and reread it and go back and reread it. You're not supposed to understand everything in, in today. Take your time. Okay? Because check this out. When you go to heaven, the Bible, Jesus even says it, that, that this word will last forever. So when you go to heaven, guess who teaches you the word? Jesus will teach you this in eternity. It would be great to know where all the books of the Bible are before you get there. I can find that one. I got you. <laughs> I know exactly where that is. <laughs> Just start. This is your secret weapon. Amen. Don't let it sit on your desk. Don't let it sit on your coffee table. Make it a part of your life. Make it, make it what it's supposed to be, life-changing and life-giving. Amen? Amen? Would you bow your heads with me? As your head is bowed and your eyes are closed, we're going to have just a, an invitation song that we're going to, have, but I, I, I don't want this 
I don't want this this um this lesson to just <clears throat> you hear it and you just I want you to do something with it. So I want to ask you, what is the Lord is sharing with you? What is it that he's saying to you? What's the challenge? I think if you were to ask me, I think the message is the same for everybody. I just want to spend more time with you. I think the Lord just wants to spend more time with us. And it's not about putting a gold star by your name or reading the Bible into it, you know, this for this next year. God doesn't care about how many times you read the Bible. He just wants you to spend time with him. He just wants to spend time with you because you mean that much to him. And he loves you and he's crazy about you and he just wants to be with you. Father, I pray, Lord, that you give our church a, a strong passion and desire to know your word. I pray that every time we open the word that it has the same spirit that Josiah brought to, to the people of Jerusalem. That it motivates us. It strengthens us. It encourages us. So God, I, I just ask that you would just speak to us in a mighty way in this time of invitation. Challenge us to be lovers of your word. Father, we thank you. We're grateful for all that you do for us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.
God is doing big things, and uh, we are moving forward, and we're closing out this chapter. We are thankful for this, this part of our journey. We're thankful that God has given us this place. But I don't know about you, but I am ready to move forward. You ready to go? Yes. So, amen. All right. You may be seated. Judy has some announcements. I made I made a, a real sound last time, but you know, for, your, for your dress and all, but I won't do that now. <laughs> Got nothing. Really. <laughs> I, what, I watched Wonder Woman yesterday. I was feeling inspired. I wasn't anticipating any of that other stuff. But thank you so much for being here today. We are beyond grateful for this space, and we're beyond grateful for each and every one of you that, as a dream team, you have made this possible. And we, we, we're speechless when we see what God has done, and we're filled with anticipation of what he's going to do. So from the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for being on this journey with us. We're moving to Abbey Lane. We will not be meeting here on Park Avenue in the upper room next week. Bittersweet. But we're excited to be doing drive-in at Abbey Lane at 10 o'clock. And we're excited for what God is going to do. We do not have our certificate of occupancy just yet, but as soon as we do, we'll be moving in. So make sure that you are signed up for our newsletter, renewalchurch.com to do that. And we will keep you um, We'll keep you up to date on when and where and what and all the details. So with that being said, we just want to say again how much we love you. We are praying God's blessings over you in the new year. And we will see you next Sunday in 2021 at Abbey Lane. So happy new year and we love you and God bless. Woo